Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this morning's Family and Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee, Thursday, the 21st of April. There is an agenda which we're going to follow this morning. So if I can start off with the agenda, item number one, which is to take any apologies for absence. Yes, Chair, I've received apologies from Councillors Ferris uh, Aiken um, and Guy Renner Thompson, Paul Rickard, Alan Hodgson, Lynn Houghton and John Sanderson. Thank you for that. We're now moving on to the second item on the agenda, which is to cover the minutes from the previous meeting. That was the meeting held on the 3rd of March. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that uh, page by page. If anyone has any indication of any changes to accuracy of the minutes. So page one, two, three, four, five, six and seven so i'll take it there's no indication there so i will happily sign those minutes as an accurate record of the meeting on the 3rd of march so now coming to item number three the important one every elected member and officer uh, has a, a standing set of declared interests um, what i'm interested in is anyone does anyone have any other disclosures of interest for any item on this morning's agenda Okay, I'm not saying anything, so that's fine. We'll take those as read. We now move on to the substantive part of this morning's agenda. We have two items. The first one being the outline business case for the replacement of school buildings for Astley High and Wittrig Middle Schools. Pages 9 to 134 in your agenda. And that's going to be taken by Sue Averston. So, Sue, please talk us through. Thank you very much, um, Chair. Yep, just a, a short presentation to support the. Um, oops, sorry, just to support the uh, the report. So, in terms of background, um, really just to set the scene. Um, unlike uh, other neighbouring local authorities, Northumberland has never benefited from being part of a, a national government-funded large-scale building prog uh, replacement program. Um, however, we have been successful in the past with three of our high schools forming part of the first two phases of priority uh, school building programme. Therefore, it remains uh, predominantly the local authority's responsibility to fund its own capital investment in its school estate. And in, rec in recognition of this, the responsibility of this responsibility, Cabinet has set aside over £100 million to invest over the next four years in new and improved uh, buildings in its medium-term financial plan. Um, of this, um, £40 million has been allocated uh, to the scheme that we're talking about today, uh, new school buildings for Astley and, and Whitrick. Um, and the reason why we are talking about Astley and Whitrick today is that they are in the greatest need of replacement when compared to the rest of the local authority maintained school um, estate. The, the buildings currently have um, in the region of £15.7 million worth of backlog maintenance uh, repairs um, to, to be undertaken. So the investment in the school um, and the buildings has been part of the medium term financial plan for the council since 2016, with the project programme to start in 2019-2020. Uh, but due to the COVID pandemic and the more recent local um, election, the project has been, has been delayed um, slightly. Um, <clears throat> you will also remember as members of FACTS that we did carry out informal consultation uh, during October and December of last year to determine the support on a proposal from the Seton Valley Federated Governing Body on the amalgamation of Seton Sluice and Whitrig Middle School. However, this proposal was not progressed at the time. Um, and as a result of this consultation, the scope for the development of the outline business case for the capital investment has now been defined and is limited to the provision for new buildings for both Astley and Whitrig Middle School on a shared site with shared facilities. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and in developing the business case, there have been a number of, a number of challenges that we've faced. Um, so really just to talk through some of those. Um, the main challenge that we that we faced has been finding a suitably sized site for the two schools um, as they're within their existing catchment area, uh, which is a planning area that we use to organise schools and therefore the new site needs to remain within within its existing catchment. Um, and the size site that we were looking for was um, a, a site as a minimum of 120,000 uh, square metres. Um, 
As with any school redevelopment, existing school sites would always be assessed for its suitability first, and FACTS will be aware of a number of um, school replacement programmes where they have been on the existing school sites. Um, however, in this case, the school site is vastly undersized to meet the current uh, guidance requirements of the DfE and Sport England, with us being nearly 13,000 square metres short, which is the size of, of two 11-a-side football pitches. Um, so, as part of our assessment in the business case, we have looked to use um, Greenbelt sites, and they have been assessed as part of the uh, site option appraisal uh, process that we've undertaken in the business case. So, um, just to draw your attention to, to a number of options, it, you know, we have looked at eight um, suitable sites within the catchment area identified um, on the uh, on the plan in front of you there. Um, and there'll be a, there's a number of reasons identified against each of the site. Predominantly, most of them have been undersized, and then there's been some um, obviously some issues around pylons, and then some environmental issues around wildlife ponds, etc., that have deemed um, the vast majority of these sites uh, unsuitable for development. Um, so, as a result of this option appraisal, uh, we have taken two sites forward uh, into the next stages of um, assessing. Uh, suitability. Um, so really just to um, set out into a little bit more detail of the six options that we've looked at in the business case. Um, so we have looked at the do nothing option. I think it's been very clear and widely supported that the do, the do, nothing, do nothing option in this uh, uh, case is not suitable. We then looked at the backlog maintenance, that's addressing that £15.7 million pounds that I've already mentioned. But again, because the type of construction uh, that Astley High School uh, has been built in, it makes it very, very difficult to do that. The level of asbestos, where it's actually situated in the window reveals, the school's <coughs> still got single glazed uh, crickle steel windows, probably the only school left in the county that hasn't been double glazed because of the levels of asbestos in the building. So therefore, if we were just to look at backlog maintenance, it would mean we would probably have to reprovide the whole school in mobile accommodation in order to carry out the repairs, therefore deeming this um, really not a viable or option in terms of providing providing best value for money. We then looked at four options in terms of uh, new buildings, uh, looking at one option on the existing Elsdon Avenue site, and then three um, additional uh, options on the site known as the Avenue. Um, and I'll come on to those in a little bit more detail in the, in the following slides. So the first of the new build options was to look at the existing uh, Elsdon Avenue site. As I've already mentioned, the site is obviously is undersized, and I think this drawing really just shows the level um, of additional playing field that, that we would actually need um, to develop on the existing site. What this option does is bring all the buildings together. It does re-provide the swimming pool as well that the school currently have. Um, it identifies some enhancement on the project in terms of a 3G pitch, as well as separate um, muggers, um, sorry, multi-games uh, areas for both the middle school uh, and, and, for, and for the high school. But you can see the challenges come when it comes to, to grass pitches. Um, and therefore, the proposal on this option is to re-provide um, playing pitches actually off-site. So this option, again, um, because it does use the off-site playing fields in order to address the shortfall, it really um, does give many disadvantages to the operation of the school in terms of safeguarding, the impact on curriculum time, as the children and young people would have to travel on foot to the off-site pitches uh, for their uh, PE lessons. And therefore, this option isn't supported by the school either, because the impact that it would have on teaching and learning for the, for the children and young people. So option four is the first of the options that, uh, that looks at the Avenue site, um, which is um, based still within the, um, within the school's catchment area, directly behind the, uh, the ice cream shop, for those of you that know the area quite well. Um, <clears throat> again, this option brings together all the buildings, all the playing fields and all the car parking. The challenges that we've had with this option is that there's, um, in effect, a ransom strip of land that is owned by the National Trust uh, that was gifted to them by Delaval Estates uh, when they transferred seat in Delaval Hall because of the historic um, importance to uh, the tree-lined avenue down, down to the hall. We have been in discussions for the last three years with the National Trust to see if we could um, 
uh, again additional land in order to provide the uh, the access onto site as you're seeing drawn here unfortunately or whilst they are supportive of the project um, their charitable articles in which the uh, National Trust is set up means that any decision making needs to go all the way through the House of Lords in order to be able to deliver on this option <coughs> and we really felt in assessing this as an option that we couldn't wait for another three years minimum um, before a decision could be made to take this forward given the risks that we have about the ongoing maintenance and concerns we have around, around the school building. So then we looked at an alternative option, um, still enabling us to bring the uh, playing fields and school buildings together and looked at an alternative access onto site. So option five here we call the park and stride. So what it does do because of the, uh, the, the access off an existing um, uh, prospect place is we've split the car parking, provided a limited amount of bus drop-off for the two buses currently used for school transport um, and some um, DDA parking as well as some drop-off opportunities for teaching staff. But the majority of parking would be off-site on the old site of the Whitrig Middle School. This does also enhance what's currently available um, in the local area and would provide pick up and drop off spaces for parents. So again, keeping parental uh, parking actually off the highway. Um, but again, this, while supported by a lot of people, there were some concerns by school staff having to walk uh, to, to, to off site parking. So that led us to a further option that we developed, which is option six um, within the business case. And this has um, been determined as our preferred option, um, as it gives the greatest level of benefit for the school and the wider community, as it brings together all the new facilities on one site. The site is of a suitable size to future proof any increased in demand for ch school places or changes to school organisation. And it would also provide the minimum amount of disruption to education um, of the children during the construction phase. It also precludes the use of the land in the ownership of the National Trust, which would enable the schools to be operational in their new, uh, from their new site in their new buildings from April 2025. Um, we've also carried out, as set out in your report, um, some consultation uh, during the development of the business case. So we have um, consulted um, on all of the options with Northumberland County Council planners, our highways development team, Sport England, Historic England, the National Trust and Hastings Estates, who are the owners of the land off the avenue. And all of their views have been taken into consideration in recommending the preferred option that we have put forward in the business case. The site uh, that we are recommended is situated in the green belt and therefore would require very special circumstances um, to be presented to support the proposal for development in the green belt. The fact that this should be clearly evidenced and the out and uh, the benefits should outweigh any harm that it would bring uh, to the green belt and the loss of openness. Those benefits have been discussed with NCC planning officers and from a planning perspective, their initial view was that very special circumstances would outweigh the harm to the green belt um, and the development on the avenue site could be supported um, from the information that they've received so far. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that picture of Leslie's dog. <laughs> oh, God, God. <laughs> sorry, Leslie. It's not moving. <laughs> um, so really, just, just to bring to conclusion then, um, I think you know, it's been very clearly stated uh, the need to improve buildings for Astley High School and Whitrig Middle School um, and had been identified as a priority for the council uh, going back a number of years. Therefore, following a series of delays in developing the proposal for new schools, it has now been possible to complete the work on the outline business case and it now sets out in considerable detail um, the deliverability and affordability of the scheme within the council's resources. Um, but again, as with any proposal uh, for change, not everyone will support it, especially when it involves relocating a, relocating a school site. However, in this case, there has been a clear body of support from the vast majority of those that attended the recent public consultation event um, and on the, on the options um, presented to you today. The new school buildings for Astley and Whitrig are much needed and everyone was, was clear that that was the case. And the majority also favoured the two of the three options, that was option four and option six, 
uh, on the avenue site. So whilst there was, um, there was very little support for the development on the existing uh, school site with off-site playing fields. Therefore, um, officers are recommending to the Council's Cabinet to approve the outline business case to allow the project to progress with option six as the preferred option to a detailed design stage in order that procurement and submission of a planning <coughs> application for the project um, can be undertaken. The outcome of the procurement exercise will be reported back to Cabinet in the form of a final business case in order to seek final approval and award the contract at this time next year, so in April 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, before I open it up to the floor, I think it might be useful just to put a bit further context in because this has been going on for a number of years. Because when I was cabinet member, Children's Services, I think we had met and and and, and Dalja and, and a few others about this very plan. So this has taken a long time to come to fruition and to be in a situation where we're having this presented. And I think if anyone um, hasn't had the ability to meet the school or to go to visit the school. Uh, when I uh, spent quite a few hours walking around, um, the electrics were not good. As you say, the windows, the asbestos, um, and education is being provided. The absolute passion from all the teaching staff and the young people there and the governing body. But clearly the school needed work and support. So I'm delighted that we've actually got something in front of us today. Um, and this is the point of what our meeting is today. We now have the option to look at this, to, to provide any challenge, to provide support for this then to be presented to Cabinet, I think, which is next week, with them making their final decision. So we've got a really important part to play in education for um, it, it, you know at least two, three generations to come in the Seton Valley area. So... On that point, what I'll do is um, I'll open it up to the floor for anyone to make comments and we'll summarise at the end what those comments are, which will then go through to Cabinet. I'm sort of seeing Councillor Ball indicating she wants to speak there, which if the camera hasn't got, she's waving. Um, and then Councillor Dodd. So Councillor Ball and Dodd. Thanks, Chair. So a massive thank you to Sue and the team. Great report. And obviously there's been a, a lot of hard work went into this. I do have some questions. Car parking, will there be enough for the site, not only now, but going forward? Um, the sporting facilities, it looks like there's going to be some amazing facilities on there. Will they be also open to the community as well? Or after the school gate shut in the night time, will they be lost? Because it would be quite a nice thing. Obviously, the school does need priority on them, but will they be available for hire? The new build, um, I'm assuming that everything is going to be green and energy efficient and obviously... <laughs> getting the most out that site and one other question what happens obviously it is a nearer site of historical interest what happens when the build starts if it becomes a site of historical interest itself and everything has to stop or archaeological digs etc have to happen i really love simple questions <laughs> well done <laughs> sue over to you OK, so in terms of historical interest, obviously, I, you know, I, I think I mentioned we have uh, had several meetings uh, with Historic England. They are only interested in the, you know, in the boulevard kind of um, access uh, along the site. The site is currently um, a farmer's field. It's being farmed. We have undertaken um, our desktop surveys, which is probably, you know, in the probably 200 pages that you see within the, with, within the business case. Um, and touch wood she says for uh, for once we haven't got any archaeological interest on this site unlike we did at Ponteland and you know, might be aware we probably spent about six months doing an archaeological dig on Ponteland before we actually started the build and did find a burial ground which was really really interesting that, um, and obviously the artifacts that we found there have been have gone down to Durham University so we are used to obviously coming across some interesting uh, items uh, when, when we start work but we, we feel quite confident on this site uh, that we're not going to come across that on, on this occasion. Um, obviously, we've also done all our uh, um, environmental checks in terms of uh, newts, bats, and etc. as well. But that becomes part of the uh, part of the development of, of, of any sites. And again, we have the professional team to support us to make sure that we don't fall foul of uh, of anything there. 
In terms of car parking, uh, yes, there's considerable increase in parking um, that you've seen on the drawings today that will help uh, local traffic allow for pick up and drop off for, uh, for parents. The other reason behind us looking at, at the off-site parking is that we felt that that could also help the community evenings and weekends with the new station opening in Seaton Deleville that the car park could be used for any overflow car parking if there was a large event that people wanted to travel uh, by train. So again, there's been a bit of a driver in the background to see what else community benefit this, uh, you know, this scheme could actually deliver. Um, so I haven't mentioned that in the presentation, so perhaps that's something I should have picked up on, uh, which is which is absolutely right. Um, and again, in terms of environmental performance of the building, you are correct, and I should have also included that in the presentation, that this will be our first net zero um, school in Northumberland. Um, so whilst it, when the school is in operation, uh, it will be uh, net zero, so therefore we'll be using lots of new technologies. Uh, what that will do for the school itself is obviously make some savings for them on running costs, uh, which hopefully will mean that that funding will then be put into teaching and learning as well. Um, and I think that was the answer to everything, was it? Sporting. Community Pensible. facilities as well. Sporting. Oh, sporting facilities, yes, sorry. Yes, so that, that's the whole reason. Again, I think, you, you know, you've, uh, you've seen me say in the presentation, the added community benefits. So, yes, the playing pitches, the 3G pitch particularly, the swimming pool will be open for evenings and weekends uh, for uh, the local sporting clubs and community to use. We did invite the local sporting clubs as well to the uh, recent consultation event so that they've got on board very early with the development of the project um, and will be for, and will form part of that moving forward and will certainly be a driver behind the kind of facilities that we provide on those grass pitches. Thank you. Thank you. That's absolutely amazing to hear. Councillor Dodd. Yeah, um, it was highlighted when I was down that area not too long ago uh, that, you know, they're going to build a school in here. And the traffic on this road was, uh, I wouldn't say enormous, but it was constant. And I, I, I understand that, you know, we can't delay going to Hastings Estates or whatever to get permission of a different road. But sometimes, you know, when you have to put a developer's hat on, and when a developer makes a brand new estate, there's always a little patch that's left to go into the next field so that in years to come they can cash in again and they've got the access or whatever. And is there any way that a design could be made? Because I think traffic is going to be, it's not, it, traffic is a problem now. And it, it's been lovely this last few days being able to drive through Pontyland without any traffic at all. And some of these other places, we, we all know that the catalyst is at the pinch points of school opening and closing. So I, 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 my question is, do we run a parallel uh, or an emergency sort of access that is sort of semi-designed in here in case it becomes an absolute nightmare of a problem because it was, I did try to get out of one of the, the you know, where the access is and it took a very long time and that's without other people coming in and out of school. So I, I, I think we've got to think a little bit cleverly on this and have a twin prong approach to say, you know, if it goes, if it doesn't go the way we have, we have uh, written to the House of Lords or we've done this and we've done that and we have a, a plan B that we can change because we all know that these things change as they go on. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, what, what, you'll, what you'll see in um, option six, as you, as you rightly point out, there is an existing <coughs> access uh, that Hastings Estates actually do have, but it's an eight metre width access. So the, the option six still uses that eight metre width um, access to bring in um, any servicing for the, for, you know, for the building, refuge collections, deliveries, etc. cetera. Um, so we, we will be gaining that, that right of access, but yes, could certainly look to continue our discussions and developments with the National Trust to gain the other eight metres that we would, uh, that we would actually, <coughs> actually need. Um, so we are still keeping that, that right of access um, and can continue to pursue a, a, a wider width. Okay, but we'll but definitely pick that up at the detailed design stage. I've got Councillor Swinburne indicating to speak as well. 
Thank you, Chair. Um, so I've got a, a few questions and a couple of technicalities, if I can cover. But um, firstly, I, I recall when you were a Cabinet member yourself, you know, discussing this, um, when questions were raised about building this new school and, and you said yourself, well, bring me a business case. We've come on a long way since then. And thankfully, we've had the consultation, which, you know, that brings a lot more into this. Um, just a couple of things, I'll say technicality. So on page 39, we're looking at the score and matrix. In option four on the planning, um, <clears throat> on that, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> on that option in the planning, we've scored that as a five, but in the planning on option five and six, it's the same wording on planning and it's only been scored as a four. So that might need to be reviewed because we need to be consistent in the scoring on there if we're wording it the same on those options. So that's just a bit of a technicality. So can I just clarify that when you said page 39, there are two page numbers. So there's 39 at the top, at the top. but at the bottom it's 58, at the top. just for the benefit of anyone looking through their agenda. Yeah, so it's not page number at the top, so, so just to check that. Um, also, page number 68 at the top, um, it references um, previous uh, planning policies, and as we know we've got the new local plan now, so that would need to be updated. Um, so that's just a couple of technicalities. Um, Councillor Ball and Councillor Dodd have already raised um, about the parking and as many of us elected members will already have experienced concerns, schools within the localities, traffic concerns. Um, we need to be very, very careful when we've got the opportunity with planning schools and I'm going to say a, a blank canvas to make sure we get this right. Um, I think we've all experienced the problems of schools within residential areas uh, or close to and the problems that this can bring. And Councillor Dodd has just, just explained about problems getting out of, of roadways when it's not busy and during term times um, this is you know, highly exacerbated and um, there are parents who want to park you know, right up to school gates, etc., and drop-offs, and we then have problems where we have to go to uh, highways and things like that afterwards. So, if we can get that right beforehand, that that is a massive benefit. Um, one thing I do want to ask to be mentioned. You know, we've got the budget for this. We go to tender. Do we have enough? I'm going to say headroom to allow for increases in costs and inflation, which will be inevitable over the build period. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I'll, picking up on the, a couple of the technicalities, yes, I'll go back. Um, obviously, the um, scoring matrix and the assessment uh, for the society is done by an independent surveyor, um, so I'd need to have a conversation with them as to why the wording um, and the scores don't match up to the to the other three options. I probably feel that it's probably something more to do with the wording than the scoring, um, probably because of not the, all the land not being in the ownership um, to be able to deliver the scheme that's in front of us. But I'll double check and I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. Um, sorry, the other question, Councillor Swinburne, I forgot. Budget head. Oh, yeah, sorry. In terms of in terms of the budget, um, yeah, we have um, not, we haven't used costs um, because as you say on a weekly basis things are changing the availability of supplies um, is, is difficult uh, in the current market therefore we've we've actually done some real market testing with the uh, the cost that you see within within the uh, the outline business case and the recommendation still is as well although the business case um, states that we could deliver this um, project for just over 37 million the recommendation is that we leave the 40 million pound allocation within the budget um, to allow um, when we go out to procurement to give us that headroom um, but we have already built in um, inflation as well as the additional cost that we need for net zero and that adds about 18% to the budget overall so that has already been taken uh, into account when developing those options and again I think you can see that's all clearly laid out in detail in the business case. You happy with that? Yeah okay so Councillor Dale has indicated she wishes to speak as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think one or two people have already asked, asked some of the questions. Um, there were one or two things, though, which I could base actually on page 39. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, just about the 
ownership of the land. It's, going to, it's the leasehold, it looks like. They're, they're selling the leasehold, not the freehold. Um, I just wondered if that had any, um, any difference in the actual future of the site of the school. That's going ahead a long time. Um, just about the highways. Um, Councillor Dodd mentioned uh, Pontyland. Pontyland is a nightmare in the morning. It's a nightmare in the evening. It is absolutely appalling um, how the, and that needs to be looked at at the same. So I agree with what Councillor Dodd's saying about um, coming out of the avenue. I don't actually know the road. Um, so I think that is very important because once again, you're putting two schools onto one site. Um, the other issue is that um, is actually access. Um, one of the things that came out when we were developing Hexham, when they were developing Hexham High School, that um, there was no school travel plan that uh, other councillors had been uh, consulted on. So hence the issue with uh, the travel plan for people uh, going to Hexham High School. So it is important that you get what Councillor Dodd was saying about traffic, but also um, school travel plan. So all councillors involved who have kids, children, pupils going to those schools are consulted. Um, I wasn't consulted on Hexham at all, although my children go, students go there. Um, and, it, you know, it, we all have part of that. So I presume all the councillors who have children going to the high school or the middle school will be consulted. Um, the other thing is that um, I know Councillor Daly and I've always been interested in school travel plans, but also cycle routes. And indeed, with the cycling board, we started looking at uh, cycling in Cramlington as far back as 2013-14. Um, and it's so it would be good to see if this actually was included in uh, any future plans for cycle routes for that area. Because the less use of cars and buses, etc., would be of benefit. Uh, so that was something to be looked at. And I, as I said, I don't know if that's been included um, in the plans. Um, just to say, I think this is absolutely great that you're actually doing something about uh, Astley High in particular. Because I remember going back, I think, 14, 15, Councillor Richardson in the area used to stand up all the time saying, when are you going to do something about it? When are you going to do something about it? And obviously it's not easy because of actually the position of the land and the shortage of available land. So it's been very difficult to actually take anything forward. But I'm pleased that actually you've got there. Um, I just hope that the, the, the land, um, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the, the land uh, discussions will go the right way um, so it's just if you could answer one or two of those questions, please. Thank you. Yep. In, in, in terms of uh, the lease of the site, um, we, we do lease a number of sites, I think, um, from, for education purposes. And previously, the Whitrig Middle School site itself was also leased from Haysinger Sites. So it's, it's, it's a relationship that, that we've had, a long-standing relationship as a council with Hastings Estates. Um, their preferred option was not to sell us the site, um, that they would prefer for us to actually have a lease on the site. Um, and again, that, that becomes standard practice, I think, really, for for landowners, very similar to the situation that we've got with the Duchess's High School in Annick. Um, but again, the lease is going to be for 125 years. It's not a short term lease. Um, therefore, the, le the length of the lease will probably be longer than the uh, than the life uh, time of the of the actual building that we're building and also would form part of any multi-academy trust transfers that the DFE require 125 year lease for for any sites as well so we're quite confident that that you know um, the long the length of the lease um, will certainly outlive um, probably the investment that we're making in terms of highways issues yes exactly um, as councillor Dodd has said um, obviously a full assessment transport impact assessment um, will, will be undertaken at the next stage and our detail design will um, take into account all the issues that, that are identified in that as well as the issues that you know that you've all raised here today we are hopeful though with the level of um, 
on-site parking and pick up and drop off for parents that that would alleviate um, a lot of the issues um, that we did used to see in Ponteland and again with the increased parking at, at Ponteland it does keep the traffic um, actually onto the school site rather than, than off it so is it is more improved the issue we've got there is the amount of um, children that travel from Newcastle into Ponteland and therefore those traffic increases are due to that not to our um, not to our locality Astley High School and Whitrig do serve their local community. There are some uh, inward um, migration, shall we say, from some areas of Bl Blythe, but predominantly it, they do serve their own catchment area and therefore, as you rightly say, um, encouraging walking and cycling routes as part of this development will be absolutely key to making sure that we mitigate against any highways um, issues. In terms of the school travel plan, that will be a planning condition. It always is. It is down to the school to develop their travel plan in conjunction with their parents, uh, children and young people um, and it will be their responsibility to consult on that but I'll make sure that they do um, involve the local elected members. We do involve our local elected members in, um, in Seaton Delaval um, as we have done in Ponteland and Hexham um, in terms of our members working group so they will form part of that group and that document can come to them uh, for their discussion and, and consultation as well. Thank you. I think Councillor Dale wants to come back. Yeah, to yes, I did. I just wanted to two things. Just one quickly is that, um, as far as Hexham is concerned, we weren't involved. A lot of the councillors were not involved um, in the working group. So that is something that we need to pick up in future, make sure that they are involved. Um, but secondly, is, um, is there any win from the lease? I mean, we've obviously got the other buildings leased. One, where, one of the schools where the land, as you said, is, under, is leased, um, will that go back to the owner? And um, so there's no gain, capital gain for housing or anything on that land? Not for the council anyway. Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, so, yes, yeah, sorry, you probably um, may not explain it very well. So the previous site of where Wittering Middle School was before it relocated onto the site with Astley mm -hmm. was in the ownership of Hastings Estates. So that was handed back to them a number of years ago when, when Whitrig moved on to the Astley site. The yeah. Astley site is in the ownership of the local authority and again set out in the business case as an assessment of what value that could be that could bring a capital receipt to the council mm -hmm. in terms of development. Um, it sets out if only the brownfield elements were to be uh, redeveloped I think in the tune of about 1.2 million pounds would be the capital receipt for the local authority but we're hoping that that would increase and enable us to so. develop on the green field yeah. um, and we can offset that against the new site as yeah, well so yeah. a minimum of 1.2 million pounds we would accept if the site was to be sold but again it may be used for other council services or other uses you know as we have done previously with uh, with education sites so that's not um that's not a given at this stage. It needs to be assessed whether there'd be further use for us as a local authority first. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Kath McAvoy Carl wanted to come in as well. So yeah, Kath. just finally. Sorry, just finally, if nobody's got any further questions, I just really wanted, and I know a number of you have done, is to thank Sue and her team for all the hard work in relation to this particular project. It has been a particular um, interest to both Sue and I because we have recognised the need uh, for that school to be rebuilt, and both of us have made a comment that it will be done before we retire. <laughs> if it, um, so. I am particularly pleased with the, with the work that's been uh, ongoing uh, more recently uh, in relation to that and, and um, you know, the, the, the number of options that we've explored is a testament to the complexities of this particular project in, in itself. So um, thanks, Sue. Thanks to you and your team. So if I can just draw this to a, a, a conclusion, um, just a couple of things, if I can, Sue, just that I want to bring up. In terms of the procurement model, when we got to procurement, there it, and there's the building work started, which is a great link into what I'm just going to say. Um, there is a requirement now for 10% of procurement to be linked to social value. So what I'm really keen to, to explore, and, I, and I'm sure it will happen, is that we do look to encourage local apprentices and local <coughs> sourcing of labour for um, whoever the, the contractor, the successful contractor is. Um, and the fact that it's going to be a net zero school is a really positive thing. Um, and I just wondered if you could also just explain to me what's going to happen with the swimming pool? 
Okay, so in terms of the swimming pool, the, exist, the existing one, so that will be demolished um, and then will be re-provided on the new site. So there will be a new one um, being re-provided, um, probably slightly larger because it was built in yards rather than metres. Um, so it will meet the new, uh, will new, meet new, uh, new guidance. Um, obviously a lot smaller than the than the ones that you've seen in uh, the leisure centres being built more recently. Um, but again, you know, suitable for the the swimming lessons and things that currently the first schools in the in the local area uh, use it for. Um, and in terms of corporate social responsibility, um, again, I think it's probably something that um, I need to come back with as to how we have performed um, in Hexham, although it was more challenging in Hexham, given um, obviously the pandemic, although the contractor tried very hard to engage with particularly the local schools, it was very difficult uh, during the construction. But again, it, there was a, a lot of activity on Ponteland, um, and again, a number of the students that have left Ponteland High School have gone on to careers and to university in particular areas in project management in quantity surveying as a result of the amount of work experience and time that they've actually had on site so I think I haven't got the figures on the top of uh, off the top of my head um, but we would look to more than enhance by 10 percent what we would do in the in the Seton Delaval um, area particularly from our point of view from an education point of view how important um, apprenticeships um, actually are in ensuring that we've got um, a work workforce moving forward um, is something that we are very passionate about ourselves within the education department. Thank you. Great, that's good. So there are three things that we're being asked to do this morning. One is to scrutinise the report, which I think we've done, to note the allocation of the 40.9 uh, 40 million pounds, to approve the commencement of the procurement using a design and build procurement strategy, and to note the final business case to be approved by Cabinet prior to the award of the contract. Um, I think given the recommendation which is in here is the option six, I just want to also clarify whether the scrutiny committee is minded to go with that option as well. I'm seeing a, a lot of nods. So again, if that can be noted in the report that's going to Cabinet. So um, just because this is going to cabinet with our views, we will obviously note the sustainable transport plans, rec um, the procurement, social value and procurement elements, the notes around parking, um, and obviously what we've also picked up in terms of um, the land and how that will be sorted. So, given that, could I please just have a show of hands, all those in favour of recommending the cabinet that we approve? Okay, and that's on the option six. So thank you very much. That was unanimous. So we now move on to the second really important part of this morning's agenda, which is agenda item number five, the role of the Director of Children's Services, Test of Assurance, pages 135 to 138. This part of the report is going to be taken by Alan and Kath McAvoy Carr. So... Alan, I'll, are you I'll, I'll set the, I'll you, set you can set the context the and then I'll let context. Alan talk through the report. So in relation to the Director of Children's Services, it's a statutory role. And as a result of that, we have to have, um, uh, and in most areas of the country, that role is, is, is um, undertaken by one person who only has the role of, of Director of Children's Services. Where there are any changes to that or any deviation from that process, then, then we are required to provide a test of assurance to make sure that the arrangements that we have are compliant with the regulation and with um, the uh, the laws and, and, and the guidance around that statutory role. So um, uh, on a regular basis, you, you may be uh, aware that previously we brought reports to this, this meeting when I when myself as the Director of Children's Services also became the Director of Adult Services, we had to provide a test of assurance in relation to that. So this is just really a, 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 for, for scrutiny to scrutinise the arrangements um, post the 16th of May. So I'll hand over to Alan. Thank you, Kath. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, yes, as Kath's mentioned, uh, there is statutory guidance around this, uh, and uh, members may well recall receiving previous reports um, on, the, on, the, on the test of assurance. It, just in terms of the subject matter that you'll have read within, within the report, uh, and just for ease, uh, I will use the, the acronym DCS uh, rather than uh, Director of Children's Services, if that's OK. The, uh, the purpose of this report is, is about uh, providing elected members uh, with information about the uh, interim arrangements um, uh, following 
uh, Kath's departure as the DCS, which happens in the middle of May uh, of, of, this, of, of this year. And what the report does is it describes uh, what, the interim, what those interim arrangements are. So basically the role of the DCS will be shared uh, between Graham Reiter, who's the service director for children's social care, and also uh, with uh, Audrey Kingham, who's the senior service director and director of education. Um, there has to be one named DCS for statutory purposes, and that is Graham. Um, the, uh, the report also provides information about the integration and governance arrangements that exist, um, because one of the key cornerstones really about these interim arrangements going forward is to provide continuity and stability, um, uh, both to service users and also to the workforce within children's services. The report does describe the, uh, uh, the senior management teams that, that support Audrey, Audrey and Graham and, and, and also about the range of skill and experience that exists within those senior management teams and obviously also within, uh, within Audrey, Audrey and Graham as well. And also, lastly, the, the report does describe the, um, uh, the governance arrangements, the partnership boards that exist um, and, and therefore provides elected members with reassurance about the links that are going to be retained, uh, for example, with adult services, because the decision has been taken to separate out the, um, uh, the role of the director of adult services um, from, from the director of children's services. Uh, Kath, Kath has been the lead executive director for, for adult services, but going forward, um, the di directorship of adult services is going to be taken forward elsewhere. So Graham and Audrey um, will, will have oversight of children's services. And so, in, in, in effect, that is that is a slightly narrower narrower focus. Um, and, uh, and, and lastly, the, the, the report uh, uh, obviously names some of those partnership boards that I've that I've talked about before. Uh, for example, the Children and People's Strategic Partnership, uh, what members may recall as being the local safeguarding children's arrangements, and, and the joint up with the adults safeguarding arrangements as well, um, and also around the special educational needs. Um, board, board as well. And the report also describes uh, the, the position that Kath leaves children's services in and, and, and some, of, some of the uh, uh, work, work, work that's taken place in terms of the positive Ofsted inspection on children's social care, the review of special educational needs by Ofsted and CQC um, uh, as well, and, and also the improvement within education and performance as well. And uh, I'm sure Kath's happy to take any questions, and I am, I, I am too. Thank, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Dale. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And the Director of Children's Services is such an important position. Um, as we talked about safeguarding, so she said this, this, it just lists and lists of really very, very important responsibilities. Sorry, I'll take that off so you can see. Um, lists of very important responsibilities, and it's the future and well being of our children that are at stake if this or something goes wrong. And can I just say, first of all, that obviously with Kath um, McAvoy uh, has been exemplar as a director of children's services, um, and she'll be a, a, a very sore and sad miss. Um, however, I'm looking around, and um, this is a big puzzle, and it's got lots and lots of pieces in that puzzle. And part of the puzzle is actually the cabinet member who is responsible for overseeing children's services. Um, I have actually all uh, respect for the directors who are going to be working, and I think I can ask and challenge them here. But actually part of the bigger picture is either the cabinet member or indeed the leader who should be here to ask questions to see how the whole puzzle is going to work together and fit together. It's awful when you do a jigsaw puzzle and in the end there's one piece missing and it's the main piece. And I actually feel that uh, either the cabinet member or the leader should have been present or even the deputy leader should have been present to uh, show how they're going to respond and respect our new uh, arrangements. So that's something that I actually would like to uh, have minuted because I feel very strongly about it because it's such an important issue. Um, can I just say I have every confidence in the DCA um, 
Are there any issues that you find um, in taking forward your different positions that um, you will need help or guidance or input in? Or uh, it's just it's the overall responsibility, which is vast. Um, but it was just to know that we're we're here to support you. But if you have any issues you want to raise, or do you think you are able to work together well? I'm being really, I'm being, what's the word? I'm scrutinising how you get up in the morning and you think, I don't like that man or I don't like that woman, I can't work with her. I can't work with him, whatever. But actually, <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that you have a good working relationship and you have response and respect and you all both know where you're going together to ensure that uh, Graham is the obviously the, is actually going to be compliant with all government uh, legislation. So there were two points there, one about the cabinet side and one about the, the staffing side. So so I can't queuing up to answer the questions. Yes. Oh, go on. <laughs> thanks, Chair, and thanks, <laughs> Councillor Dale. That was an interesting set of questions there, I have to say. So just uh, very quickly in relation to the political support uh, ar around these arrangements, we have talked um, uh, uh, with both the leader and with the cabinet member for children's services uh, in relation to this and, and it's also been to the staffing and appointments committee uh, for their approval yep. um, as well uh, I think by the fact that we've got two um, people in the joint DCS role uh, which is particularly unusual mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's because we've got two very strong uh, leaders of both of the services around children's social care and and uh, I was going to say adult social care obviously we've got a strong leader around adult social mm -hmm. care as well but uh, yeah. in relation to education um, the reason why Graham has taken the nominated role is because social care uh, contains the greatest risks yeah. and obviously Ofsted are on the phone every other week it seems yeah. uh, in relation to oh good grief don't minute that um, yeah. in relation to uh, inspection activity so it was felt that that was uh, on the advice of, of, of our national ADCS um, uh, colleagues that was felt to be the most uh, appropriate way forward I'm sure Graeme and Audrey can speak for themselves, but what I would say is that Graeme and Audrey get on inordinately well. Um, they share a room or they have shared a room uh, together and actually um, uh, they, they do lots of joint work together. So I, I, I wouldn't have chosen them both to deliver on that role if I hadn't felt that they, sorry, chosen. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have nominated them both to, to, to undertake the roles together if I hadn't felt that that actually is together they would be stronger and be able to um, manage the very difficult um, uh, children's yeah. services or navigate the very difficult children's services mm -hmm. uh, processes that we are uh, part of on a daily basis. So I have every confidence in their ability to be able to deliver. Can I, can I just add to that? Because obviously, sorry, the, <coughs> what is written down here, the rise in numbers of children living in poverty in the northeast and actually in this area is obviously going to give give a, a greater demand on your services and greater demand on the safeguarding issues in particular um, so you know it's not an easy job and I have to say once again I do have respect and I do think that um, with your confidence in them I is, is added to mine too so just to say thank you and um, I just wish everybody every good work, good employment, and I hope if you've got anything you want to say, do come back to this committee or whatever, because I'm children's service to me is one of the most important elements of the council's delivery service. Okay. And um, I think the fact that Sue's sitting between us doesn't mean anything <laughs> at all, uh, just to be clear. And, and I think one of the, in the serious point, one of the discussions was about how well we could work together, and we certainly have done over the time we have. And I think there's been a lot of developing joint working between our services over the period of time anyway. Uh, but I think we did have very honest discussions about how effectively we could do it. And I think Audrey and I are very confident that we can do that effectively together and continue to develop the leadership and work that Kath has certainly taken us to a very good, much better place in uh, for that. And the, the, the key issue, I think, for us is trying to give continuity and stability for our workforce and therefore for our uh, people who use our services. And I think we can achieve that. Audrey, go on, chip in. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Dale, just to say thank you very much. Um, I don't think Graham and I, either of us, would be shy at coming forward or, or bringing to the attention of this committee any areas that we'd want to, to make sure you were cited on. Um, I, I agree. I mean, I, um, 
I do enjoy coming to work and part of that is the colleagues, both the team, I have an education, but actually the really close working relationship with um, children's social care at every level. We've done some amazing work together, particularly around SEN over the last few months, um, having gone through two inspections uh, and that doesn't come about by accident. That's everybody working together. Um, and I would just say, yes, poverty is something we are particularly cited on. Um, have been for quite a while um, and uh, I'm sure that this committee will hear much more about that in the future. Uh, we'll be bringing that forward again. So thank you. Thank you. If I can bring in Councillor Ball and then Councillor Swinburne. First, I just want to say thank you for everything that you've done for Northumberland County Council, CAF, and good luck in your future roles and wish you all the best in everything that you do going forward. So questions on this. Why is it on the agenda? It says it's an interim arrangement, not a permanent arrangement. Why? Um, then it appears that we're going to have three people doing a job that was currently done by one person. That's how hard you are to replace, Kath. Um, so there's going to be three people. How are we going to make sure that, because it is going to be crossover in certain parts, how are we going to make sure nobody drops the ball because safeguarding and children and young people are so important? So how do we make sure that there is the right reporting systems in place? Then on page 136, it says that um, Audrey and Graham's scope of res responsibilities will be narrower. What's going to happen with the other things? Who's going to be picking them up? Because obviously, if they've got certain focuses, what's happening with the rest? Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor uh, Ball. So, um, in relation to the interim position, that's because the structure of the council is not yet um, uh, sorted. So, you'll be aware that there has been some work ongoing about what the senior senior management structure will look like in the future. Until that's sorted, we can't really advertise for um, a, a DCS or for a, or for a director of adult services in relation to that. So, the issue about Graham and Audrey's role being narrower is is because they will focus on children's services alone and not adult services and not the fire service and they also won't be deputy chief exec so they will have that capacity and that understanding to be able to to focus on children's services which is a vital part of, of, of what they do so uh, graham's role what we haven't done sorry is explained what might happen underneath graham and audrey um and and i, I you know I, as much as i would like to be involved in that it's for them to manage what <clears throat> for them to manage once i once i've gone then we'll need to look at the capacity of what's happening underneath those structures to make sure that we've got enough to to deliver on the services that, that that we need to um graham you know graham's lead is social care and safeguarding so he will um that you know that's his bread and butter so he will continue to do that in relation to the adult services and the relationships between with adult services graham audrey and neil have already met who's going to manage adult uh, social care have already made that commitment to um, continue that joint working to make sure that there are any opportunities where we can do things together and um, will we'll continue in the future so you know any safeguarding uh, issues that might need to be addressed via the transitions or via adults and children will, will, will remain and they will continue to have joint um, uh, meetings in order to make sure that there isn't anything that they need to address together or that they can address things together. Um, just, I do have a little bit of a concern about the interim and how long do we see this being, because it might potentially go from one to two, back to one again, and it's that disruption and it is just such an important thing, safeguarding, that if systems keep on changing, eventually something goes wrong. So I don't disagree with you in relation to that. It, I have, I have written the job descriptions ready to go as and when they as and when the structure is, is agreed or sorted I'm you know I, I can't I, I don't know how long that will be I'm hoping that it will be within the next few months that we'll have an understanding of what those structures will look like um, in order that the permanent positions can be uh, can be advertised they are two statutory roles that stand alone so actually in terms of the uh, you don't have to have people in place in order to get that structure but you do need a structure to be able to to, to, to describe uh, what might happen moving forward so yeah hopefully as soon as possible Councillor Swinburne <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate this is like a, a statutory report that we see. Um, can I just confirm, Kath, this is your last meeting? Yeah. Yeah. So apologies for going a little bit off topic, but as the former vice chair of this committee and then chair of this committee, um, just want to <coughs> pass on my own thanks. Um, I'm going to go back to 2017 when I was first elected, and I'm aware that that 
you had conversations with a former cabinet member to say, look, we need to do some work here. Um, and we've come a long way in our education results, in the standards that we've got in Northumberland, and it's down to you and the team that you've built up around you. Um, and were it not for you and, and the work that you've done, we'd be a long way from where we are at the moment. Um, on a, a more personal level, um, I know you've been a go-to person when, you know, myself and other members have been, you know, we've had issues with, with residents and we've just, for want of a better term, picked up the phone and went, where do we go? And you've took it on board and that is purely down to you. You're going to be a massive loss to this authority. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's how I feel. Um, but just thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Mark. So, um, I, I'm going to try and uh, br bring this to a, a conclusion. I echo everything Mark said. It's sad that you feel that you have to go. Um, but it is what it is. So I just want to, um, if I can, just summarise something. Uh, when I was um, Cabinet Member at Children's Services, one of the first meetings I had with Cap, uh, well, first of all, I walked in and I got this great big blue file from Andy Johnson, who was the <laughs> Director of Education. And he said, can you ever read through this? And I said, now. And he went, yeah. I said, any important bits? And he went, probably all of them. And I remember skimming through and then I went in to see Kath. And one of the things that Kath said to me is, we're hated by the family's court. They absolutely hate us because the reports aren't being filled. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. That was your mission. It was Kath's mission to get the family courts to love Northumberland County Council. And actually, the, re the really simple reason, that's affecting young people's lives. Uh, I won't name the judge, but I know the name of the judge. Um, and that transformed. Reports were being done on time. The detail was in there. Things weren't being deferred because the, the lack of information. That had a direct impact on the ability of young people to be placed. And that was down largely to Kath having a vision for what good and outstanding would look like. And on that point, I sat in 20... 19 when Ofsted gave us our um, Ofsted rating. Previously we'd been rated RI within our children's services. And I remember seeing, I was interviewed by Ofsted, officers were interviewed by Ofsted. I was saying to Kath, Kath, we're going we're gonna to get out of RI, trust me. No, we're not, we're not. And I'm sure she won't mind me sharing this story with you. But the morning we got the feedback, Kath was in tears because we went from all right to good. And in that meeting, which was a private meeting, so I'm not going to share all of it from Ofsted, but the word outstanding features was used. We would not have got to outstanding features had it not been for Kath and the vision that she had. And actually, Daljit working with you and other senior officers and the, the political leadership as well, which, which drove that. The Social Work Academy, social, our Social Work Academy, which has brought in the new generation of social workers to work with our young people, um, is an exemplar of good practice. And the other thing within that as well is that as an authority, we're leading in terms of performance on, on early years, on primary, we still need to do more work on secondary, which is why as a committee, I'm bringing in the Regional Schools Commissioner because most of our secondary schools are academies. So bringing them in, holding them to account. And then the other thing which Kath won't tell you is she was in Parliament, I think it was last year, the year before, giving evidence to a scrutiny committee. So there you are. So, you know, she, she's appeared there and, and our loss is going to be Newcastle's gain. And um, on a personal level, can I just say Audrey and Graham, two more outstanding people to actually carry on your role, I could not find. Um, so I'm very confident, and I know that Ofsted, when they're looking at will see this as a very positive thing. But I do want to put on record 
UCAF personally that I found you incredibly supportive when I was cabinet member and uh, for children's services deputy leader and also um, uh, in my role as chair of facts you will be a miss um, and I am sure that all of the work that you've embedded within this authority and the culture that you've set within children's services and adult services will continue so I am sure on behalf of the whole committee, we would want to wish Kath the very best. I hope you're not a stranger. Keep oh, in I'll contact. Be checking. Don't you worry, I'll keep, be checking up. Keep watching these <laughs> scrutiny meetings. So, um, you know, we, we've been asked to, to note this report. I think we've made our views clear and uh, our concerns, and I know particularly the concern by Councillor Ball about the interim arrangements. It is vital that the leadership of the council put through that structure to ensure that there is the continuity of officers within within the council. So on that note, I think we can accept the report. And thank you again, Kath, for everything that you have done. It has been exemplary. It's so, always been my favourite meeting. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Oh, I've, I've got Councillor yeah, Dale who just, wants to come in as well. We sh I think we all should stand up and say thank you, actually, because I'm absolutely... Uh, the work that's been done, the social services, children, care, and everything else since she's been here, you said the wonderful words. Can we all just stand up and say thank you or applaud or whatever because actually it's been an outstanding time and I've watched you that I haven't been on I've always my heart's always been here so I just think all of us are sitting many people are sitting here who say nothing I actually think we could all join in and say thank you Kath and we'll miss you <laughs> I like the left yeah. So we now move on to um, the last part of the agenda, which is item number six, Family and Children's Services Overview and Scrutiny Committee Work Programme and Monitoring Report, pages 139 to 146. And that's Chris. Thanks, Chair. Um, it's just to inform members that at the next meeting on the 5th of May there will be a report that is going to Cabinet um, on the, the informal consultation um, that will seek Fax's views. And Councillor Dale's wish. Yeah. Oh, Councillor Councillor Dale. All the schools, where they are with maintenance, who owns them, and everything else, so we can have an overall framework about how we're delivering education or how the education of Thumberland is being delivered, um, because there's quite a lot of people who won't know about how federations are working, how trusts are working, everything, there's quite a lot of people who won't know about how federations are working, how trusts are working, everything, the whole picture. And it'd be good to have it all together, if that's possible. Maybe you've done it, and I haven't been on the committee then, but also what are the, the maintenance programme, because some of our, I think everybody interesting to see what the backlog is. Um, and we are underprivileged in this council, the fact that the government has never given us a lot of money for new schools or to keep the schools program, maintenance program. And every school we change and build is a deficit on, or a debt to the council tax. So we'll be paying for these for years and years and years out of our council tax, the revenue account. Um, so I think we need to know exactly the whole picture because it gives us everybody an idea about the financial aspect of how we deliver education or how we allow education to be delivered, um, taking into account we don't get a lot of help from the government. And I think that's an important thing. So if we could add that in, that would be great. Please. That, that's that's noted. Um, we'll, 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 if we can pick that up, yeah. Any other comments on the um, the, the committee work program? No, I'm not seeing any. Okay, um, we then move on to the final item, which is any item of urgent business. I've not been informed of any. No one's indicating. So on that note, thank you very much for this morning's meeting. Thank you again, Kath. Please keep in touch. Oh, and, I'll be uh, checking. Yeah. <laughs> and Graham and Audrey know that. <laughs>
And uh, again, Graham and Audrey, just on a, a kind of a personal note, any support that you need, this committee is, is, is here. I'm sure you don't need it, but you know where we are. So thank you very much, and thank you everyone for watching this morning.